The Reverend Dr. William Barber is leading a March on Mansion. The march starts in West Virginia on Monday. Demonstrators will then make their way to D.C. with hopes of pressuring Mansion and Mitch McConnell. Co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Dr. William Barber III, joins us now to discuss. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Reverend. Thank you so much for having me on the rising. Absolutely. And, and Ryan and I were talking a lot about West Virginia yesterday, and we were talking about how there actually is a small but mighty progressive movement in West Virginia itself. So we wanted to hear from you, you know, kind of what energy are you tapping into with this initiative in West Virginia against Manchin? Well, you know, West Virginia has an interesting history. It actually was called West Virginia because they didn't want to be connected to uh, the Confederate racism. And there's a strong movement, labor movement there. There were big battles with the miners. My grandfather was actually from West Virginia. And it's interesting that I was called, uh, we have a poor people's campaign um, group there, and we were called by, by white people from the mountain uh, and black people who said, we're tired of this. We're tired of Manchin saying he's representing West Virginia. In fact, 70% of West Virginians want to see the For the People Act passed. 70, 60, over 68% want to see infrastructure pass. Over 68% want living wages because there are 350,000 people in, in West Virginia that make um, less than a $15 living wage. And what they understand is that when you empower voter suppression, uh, you are also empowering people to get elected who then will stand against labor rights and will stand against living wages and will stand against health care. So people are very clear. Um, I was with one uh, lady whose name is Pam from the mountains of West Virginia. She literally said this problem with Joe Manchin, he's not representing us. And what it is, is they want us, all of us to be quiet. This is not just an attack on black people. That's what we have to get this about this voting piece and these laws. It's an attack on black people, on white people, on brown people, on disabled people, on poor people, on women and on young people. And it's really an attack on our democracy and we cannot stand for it. That, that multiracial message that you're talking about clashes with some of the kind of Jim Crow rhetoric that we've been hearing from Democrats. Have you been counseling allies to try to make this a, a, a broader fight in, in reaching Manchin? Yes, and, and actually, I don't, I call it James Crow Esquire. You know, Jim Crow was strictly <laughs> a black folk, but James Crow Esquire put on a suit, got a computer, and started looking at how can they block uh, progressive folk from voting, because what you have in the extremist party called the Republican Party now, ever since 1968, is a, with the Southern strategy, is their goal was to make the Republican Party the party of the white people in the South. That's what they said. Uh, that's what Kevin Phillips said and others who advised Richard Nixon. And as they have progressed down through the years, <clears throat> they know they're in the minority. So they know they can only win if they suppress the vote. Justice in this country was never just about black, black and white. Frederick Douglass worked with William Lloyd Garrison, who was white. Harriet Sojourner Truth worked with uh, Lucretia Mott, who was a white Quaker. We, Dr. King said in 1965 that, that every time you try to expand voting rights, why there's such a battle is because the Southern aristocracy and the ruling class, they in fact are afraid of a black, white coalition, particularly the poor, low wealth, white black people and black people who can change the economic architecture of this country. So we don't need to just talk about this in terms of race. We need to talk about the race side of it, the class side of it, the geographical side of it. We need to connect voter suppression to suppression of all the things we know need to happen in public policy. And again, that's why we call it James Crow Esquire. What is happening with this thing with Manchin is doing? He's hurting the whole country. And one of the things we try to do is make sure that we connect there. Is, when people ask me, is it racism or is it classism? I say it is. It's both and. It's never either or. And we've never had movement in this country without a fusion coalition of people of all races, creeds and colors coming together to push this nation forward. That's what we need. That's why we're going to West Virginia. Now, I'm not going to speak. I'm going to stand with the people from West Virginia who say they want to speak. 
You know, I have a question about uh, West Virginia, as you said earlier, is a, is a very interesting state. And while I strongly disagree with the premise that some of these uh, pieces of legislation are voter suppression intended to suppress the vote on any basis of race or class, I do want to ask, you know, if you're finding support for your initiative against Manchin, common cause with people in West Virginia who probably voted for Donald Trump or who are, um, you know, friendly to Trump's populist message as you're organizing in the state. What does this coalition look like? It must be really interesting. Well, you know, when you say Trump had a populist message, remember lynch mobs were popular as a form of populism. <laughs> well, populism is not necessarily always a good thing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we got to talk, you know, but we're finding great um, coalitions, um, people from all over. Uh, you know, we've had, I've been to West Virginia now three times. And remember, we met with Manchin and we met with him with 12 people from West Virginia white and black, and they all challenged him. They challenged him. Again, the numbers tell us, not just us talking, that 70% of, um, of West Virginians want our democracy to work. They want for the People's Act. They want their voting rights protected. I've had white people up in the hollows of the mountain say that when you suppress the vote and you close, um, allow all this dark money in, it hurts us. Notice that the United Mine Workers came out right after we said we were going to West Virginia. Cecil Roberts, the United Mine Workers, came out and said Manchin was wrong. They put a press release out. And those are miners, right? Those are miners in West Virginia. And they said, we want the Florida People Act. We want uh, our vote, uh, the Voting Rights Act restored. They understand the connection between voting rights and all of the other progressive policies. And another thing. In West Virginia, they know Manchin is lying. We had a conversation the other day about this filibuster. First of all, there's no history of the filibuster ever pushing things toward a progressive way. That's just true. Secondly, he says it has to be bipartisan. The 1866 Civil Rights Act, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 1870 Enforcement Act, the Klu, the Klu Klux Klan Act, the 1875 Civil Rights Act were all just one party. In other words, if folk had not voted their principles, if they had said, well, we have to negotiate with people that want to go backwards, we wouldn't have the 15th Amendment. We wouldn't have the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. And the filibuster was used to try to block the New Deal. It was used to try to block uh, women's suffrage. It was used to try to block um, the, uh, all civil rights legislation. That's why we can't just say the filibuster is about race. It's about race and it's about class and it's about progress. The filibuster has been used to block progress and we need to talk about that in this country and build this multiracial fusion coalition to challenge this kind of regression that Manchin is trying to sell. When, when you met with Manchin back in February, what, what was his response to, to that argument and, and what do you think will, could ultimately work with him? Well, you know, he's smooth. <laughs> he's not, uh, he likes to say he has respectful conversation. I guess if you disagree with him, it's not respectful. Or if you raise your voice, it's not respectful. But one of the ladies in the meeting said, look, I knew your mama. <laughs> hmm. And she was like, I mean, she just said to him, how in the world are you standing against living wages? So then he said, well, he actually was for living wages, but he wanted to start at $11 and he had some plan to get there. You know, that's what he said. Now, he didn't say the same thing when he went to the media. But the problem with it is Manchin does a lot of complaining, but he never says what he's really against. Like, I'm against the four pieces of the four the people that, well, what? Uh, you, you, you know, he's never put on the floor a bill, for instance, for living wage. His state needs infrastructure. Where has he really put something out and led on that? He's had eight years since June 25th, 2013 to fix the Voting Rights Act. He's never done anything in eight years. So he likes to talk and smile and say, I'm with you and say, you know, I know you all, I care about you, but there's no substance in it. And that's what people in West Virginia are saying. They're saying he has abandoned them. One of the late, another person in the mountain said, we are not even hardly surviving. You know, mm -hmm. there are over 700,000 poor and low wealth people in West Virginia. That's almost 50% of the state. Think about that. And over 50% of, of, of people in the state make less than a living wage. And this man is spending his time blocking voting rights 
and blocking for the people act and blocking living wages i mean it's actually contrary to everything that's needed in his state and the people told him that and again he likes to smile but we, this is not about smiling this is not about cute conversations this is literally about people's lives i remind people all the time that the columbia school of public policy says that poverty kills 750 people a day, a quarter million people a year. People are dying in West Virginia because they don't have living wages and they don't have clean water and they don't have a uh, health care. Uh, Manchin should, dis if he was really supporting West Virginia, he would be pushing for more and not less. Now, have you heard from his office since the March on Mansion was announced? Are they doing anything um, currently to try to assuage your concerns or stop you from applying this intense pressure, really, when you're doing an, an event on this scale um, to intimidate Mansion? You know, have you heard from them trying to, you know, get you onto their side or to get you to stop from your organizing? No, you know, we've had some attacks, you know, starting to now come in from, not from him, but from the so-called right wing and extreme, because, you know, the extremists are loving it, because what he's doing is actually enabling the big lie, <laughs> because he said, oh, we don't really need this right now, and, and, and his whole language about um, uh, it has a bill isn't a good bill unless it's bipartisan actually enables the lie, because it's interesting that Republicans only holler bipartisanism when they're not in power. That's, that's the piece. So, no, we haven't heard the reach out. Now, we're going to try today uh, to actually uh, say to him, we want our rally in the parking lot where his, build, his, his office is. Now, his office is at the Lotto building in West Virginia. The last time we, was there, we were there, they would not let us have that building. So we had to meet under the underpass. And I'll let folk know the press know if they allow us to go in that parking lot uh, to, uh, Monday. But we're going, and we haven't heard anything. But, you know... The pressure needs to continue to push. I want you to know we heard yesterday from the National Council of Churches is going to join us in Washington, D.C. That's congregations from all over. When we go West Virginia, uh, the Rainbow Coalition, the Transformative Network for Justice Network, the Forward um, Justice, these are all prominent civil rights law groups that are concerned about these issues. Ohio is bringing people in. But the main thing is he has not heard from a stage of West Virginians. And that's what we're doing Monday. I want folks to understand when you tune in on Monday, you're going to hear from West Virginia. They are going to debunk the lie that what that mansion is standing for them. He's made his case saying he's doing what he ought to do as a senator from West Virginia. He's listening to the people from West Virginia where the polls don't say that and the people now are going to also say that is not true and they demand better from him. Well, Reverend Barber, be safe on your march. Thank you so much for joining us here. God bless you and thank you so much. God bless you, sir. We'll have more rising for all of you after this.